Uh, you do have an exciting lineup today. Uh, you've got Adam Robinson following me of Hierology, and I've been involved with Adam, and Adam's yet another entrepreneur who I have the opportunity to get to know and work with and you know, really have the pleasure and excitement of watching him grow his company. So thank you, Adam. And, uh, thank you to all the rest of you who you know, have given me your support and your guidance and your input. And uh, I just feel very, very fortunate to have all of you as friends and business associates. So thank you. So what I would like to uh, do with you this morning is to talk to you a little bit about uh, used car management. Imagine that. Um, and I'm going to tell you something that might, uh, might surprise you and might very well shock you. And what I have to tell you this morning is that I no longer, no longer believe in managing inventory with age. Uh, yeah. Oh, I agree. How about it? I agree. <laughs> it's true. I no longer believe about, about the efficacy of managing used vehicle inventory with age. And, and I'm going to explain that to you. Now, to be clear, though, I don't want anybody to stop managing your inventory age because honestly we're not ready to do that but what i am going to do in the brief period of time that i have with you is i'm going to try and get you started try and get you started on a better way of managing used vehicle inventory than by age so to start um, i think it's important and i'm sure that everybody does have an appreciation for what's happening with margins margin compression um, you read about it you hear about it and I think it comes home to all of us quite frequently. You know, have you ever had the experience where you get to the end of the month, you have the financial statement produced, you look at it, you look at it again, you look at it more closely, and you say, wait a minute, there's gotta be a mistake. Just gotta be a mistake. It just isn't possible that we did all that business and this is what we have to show for it. I mean, do you guys have that experience? Have you had that moment? You know, and, 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 and I believe that, unfortunately, we'll have ever more of those moments. And that is exactly the, the, the minute where margin compression has come home to you, where you look at that top line and you say, we did all that business, and this is what we have to show for it. And unfortunately, what I've observed over the past 18 months or so is extremely disturbing. So, Josh, is that, is that screened up? Um, so, first of all, um, those of you who are Velocity disciples, you know that the way that we measure how right you're in your vehicles is based on cost to market. I mean, traditionally, if we ever measured how right we're in our vehicles, we would consider what we own them for versus their wholesale value. So if we were in a car for 10 and its wholesale value was 9, we would agree that uh, we're 1,000 too high in the car. But I don't like that form of measurement because it requires you and me to agree that the wholesale value of the car is nine. And if we can't agree that the wholesale value of the car is nine, we can't agree to what extent, if any, we overpaid for the car. So for those of you who understand the velocity method of management, you know that we've given you what we call the cost to market form of measurement. Cost to market form of measurement measures how right you own your vehicles uh, not by comparing what you own them for their wholesale value, but rather what you own them for as a percentage of their average retail asking price. So in other words, if you're in a vehicle for $8,500, the average retail asking price of that car today is $10,000, you divide the $10,000 into the $8,500, and you get what we call an 85% cost to market. And that's a better form of measurement, in my opinion, because it's objective. We don't have to agree or disagree or debate or discuss what the wholesale value of the car is. Everybody today has tools that show them what the average retail price of every car is every day in the market. So for that reason, being objective, it's a better form of measurement. So here's what I'm driving at. Today, working with close to 10,000 dealers across the country, what I've observed over the past 18 months is an incredible, incredibly disturbing uh, phenomenon where costs to markets start to hit the 90% plus rate somewhere between 30 and 45 days. So I'm gonna show you uh, a slide here that represents two dealerships, of, or I should say two enterprise groups. One is on the East Coast, one is on the West Coast. One that is on the West Coast is represented here in the room today. But these are two enterprise groups that are indicative of what I see everywhere across the country. 
And both of these uh, these cost to market examples uh, are enterprises of you know 15 to 25 dealership groups rolled up as if they're one. So the one on the left, I believe, is in 10 day buckets. And if you look at what happens to their cost to market in the um, in the 30 to 40 uh, day <coughs> range, I believe it's 88 percent. And then from 40 to 50, uh, I believe it goes to 91 percent. And if you look at the one on the lower right, which is represented here in the room in 15-day buckets, I believe in the 30 to 45-day bucket, it's like 89%, and then 45 to 50 or 60, it roughly goes to 93. And that is what I'm seeing everywhere around the country. Somewhere between 30 and 45 days, I'm telling you what happens, these cars run out of juice. They are duds. They, they don't present your dealership, essentially, any effective margin opportunity. Because where your used vehicles transact today as a percentage of market is on the average somewhere in the low 90s. So if you own these vehicles, you know, somewhere around 90%, which unfortunately I'm now observing dealerships doing, you know, somewhere between 30 and 45 days, and you're transacting them in the low 90s, you only have a couple percent. And that is not enough to pay a sales commission and keep the lights on and, and have enough left over to make this a worthwhile business. Now, what I've noticed over the past 18 months is this occurring where I never, and I'm telling you guys, I never used to see cost to markets hit 90% until inventory got to about 60 days. And now I'm seeing it hit 90% somewhere between 30 and 45 days. Holy shit. You know, really, what that means is that we got to get in and out of these cars ever faster. Otherwise, they represent virtually no incremental, you know, margin contribution. And, and I saw this really start to happen about 18 months ago. And, and unfortunately, I'm not seeing it stop. I believe, and I hope I'm wrong, but I believe that a year from now, we'll see cars hitting 90% around, around the 30-day bump. Huh. That presents some really unique realities for a business. And it is perhaps what I consider to be the single greatest threat to the future. So this is no secret, this margin compression. I just happen to have the benefit, looking across close to 10,000 dealerships, to see it objectively in these numbers. So let me assure you it's real. And I know that you realize that it's real. So, you know, okay, we got a problem out there, but what are we going to do about it? Well, I've come to believe, as I said, that you managing inventory by age is no longer an effective, uh, viable means of, of, of discipline uh, used car operations. So, I'm going to explain that to you, but first, you know, in light of what I just said about this uh, increasing rate at which vehicles run out of margin opportunity, you know, let me point out that I think that all of you perhaps have a problem that you might not have really fully recognized when you came in here this morning, and that is that, you know, all of you, I'm sure, believe that if you work hard this year and do some things right, you ought to make more money in used cars this year than you did last year. So let's think about this a little bit differently. Let's think instead of starting with cars and working for profit, let's say that we're starting with oranges and we're working for orange juice. Now you understand that the oranges that you're starting with this year are slightly more dry, drier oranges than they were last year. And yet you intend to make more juice. So what are you going to have to do? Well, to be sure, you're going to have to squeeze more oranges. But there's only so many oranges you can squeeze in a day, a week, a month, or a year. But to be sure, you're going to have to be squeezing a lot of oranges. Now, suppose I hand you one of those slightly drier oranges that you're working with this year. And I say, here, take this orange and really work at it. So you take that orange and you squeeze it and work at it and labor with it. And after a good, long, hard effort, it produces a tiny drop of juice. All of us can understand that if you consume that little tiny drop of juice after that big, long, hard effort, it did not return to our system what it took to create. A hundred percent of us understand that concept. 
And if you would allow me to translate that into financial terms, what I would say is that that tiny drop of juice did not produce a meaningful marginal contribution to our system. Did not return a meaningful marginal contribution to our system, simply meaning that it took more to create than it returned. And none of us have any trouble understanding that. But for some reason, we can't see it that way when we think about that used vehicle that sold after 75 days and made it $300 front end gross profit. And I believe that is a very significant problem. So let's think about this. Dealership A and dealership B. And they both have exactly the same used car. And after 45 short days, dealership A says, I'm out, I'm done. And he retails his and he loses $300 front. Dealership B looks at him and says, you're crazy, you're nuts. You shouldn't do that. I wouldn't do it. And he doesn't do it. He hangs on to his. And after 75 days, he sells his. And he makes 300 front. So you got that? A lost 300 front after 45. B made 300 front after 75. Now, would anybody in this room like to argue that B made a smarter financial decision? No? Really? Really? You all know that A made a smarter financial decision? Then my question to you, I got one who says no, everybody else knows that A made a smarter financial decision? If that's the case, let me ask you a question. Why won't any of you act like A? If you know that A made a smarter financial decision, why will you not act like A? And I'm going to tell you, I think that answering that question holds the key to our future. So I told you I no longer believe in managing inventory age. Let's just stop and think about it. Why do we all know that after a certain period of time, a used car needs to go away? Even if we don't act in accordance with our knowledge, why do we all know that after a while, a used car needs to go away? Anybody? You guys out there? So, so when a blind guy asks you a question, you gotta give me <laughs> It's really unnerving. <laughs> why, why do we know that a used car after a certain period of time must go away? Somebody? Okay, let me give you the answer. Huh? It's going down in value. Thank you. It's going down in value. What we own it for didn't change, but its market value did change, right? Right. right. Now, you guys do not let me stray one iota from what you believe to be true. If I tell you something here in the next few minutes that you don't think is true, call me out. The reason we all know a used car needs to go away after a certain period of time is what we paid for it didn't change, but its market value did change. So am I on solid ground if I translate that into financial terms and say that we all know after a certain period of time, a used vehicle in stock likely no longer has the ability to make a meaningful marginal contribution, right? Yes. Isn't that why we all know? Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask you this question. What if you had the ability to know, and you do, that a, that a used vehicle in stock as early as day one does not likely have the ability to make a meaningful marginal contribution. If you knew that about a vehicle as early as day one, would you be wealthier and wiser for dealing with that car on day one or waiting 59 days later? Day you one. better believe it. Day one. And let me tell you the two reasons why. And again, do not let me stray from what you believe to be true. What if you knew that a vehicle on day one did not likely have the ability to make a meaningful marginal contribution, but in spite of that knowledge, you said, let it ride, give it a chance. What would we be hoping for? A miracle. A miracle to get lucky, right? <coughs> Now, how often did we get lucky on the used car lot in a different era before the internet? How lucky did we? How often did we get lucky? All the time. All the time. How often do we get lucky these days? Rarely. Rarely. Hello, newsflash. Running a used vehicle operation on the strategy of getting lucky is no longer viable. It was once viable. It once was a thousand percent viable in a different environment where we had a lot of laydowns walking around. 
just came back from Australia. And I learned what they call lay downs down under. They call them wood dumps. <laughs> I like that. I like that. There used to be a lot of wood ducks. There aren't many wood ducks around anymore. Okay? So if we did know a vehicle had this problem and let it ride, we the only viable strategy that we'd be counting on would be to get lucky to find a wood duck. So why do I not believe in the efficacy of managing inventory any longer by the calendar? Because if you really stop and think about it, the calendar was simply the best available technology for us for the first 100 years of this business. The calendar was not the problem. The age was not the problem. The calendar was simply the best available technology to inform us of a problem. The problem being that after a certain period of time, the calendar would inform us that the vehicle likely no longer had the ability to make a meaningful marginal contribution. Today, that calendar looks like a sundial. You have the benefit of the transparency of the market and the technology to have the ability to know as early as day one when a vehicle does not likely have the ability to make a meaningful marginal contribution. That is a gift of the internet. <coughs> And there are not many gifts of the internet for the car dealer. Most of the gifts of the internet have gone to the car shop. But this is truly a gift of the internet. And for the reasons we've already agreed upon, you, we would be wealthier and wiser if we dealt with that car on day one. But we won't do it. We won't do it. We won't do it. So that brings us back to the question. Why do you all know that A made a smarter financial decision, but none of us are likely to act like A? Well, here's what I've come to understand. I've come to understand that we are the first generation of used car operators to do our trade in a radically different environment, a radically different you know, this used car business has been around for 100 plus years. And sure, through those years, there were some changes, but nothing that approaches the radical transformation that has occurred in the last 10 years or so as a result of the internet. We are inheritors of the first generation of what is truly a radically transformed industry. But in spite of that, we operate today with exactly the same principles of quote unquote good used car management that have existed for the past hundred years. There's an old Hebraic expression, it's called Lador Vador. Lador Vador means from generation to generation. And from generation to generation of managers and operators of the used car industry, we, what we've done is we've handed down to the next generation as if they were tablets from the mountain on high, quote unquote principles and practices of good used car management. And the people who taught us the business gave us those tablets containing those commandments of quote unquote used car business. And therein lies the problem. We today cling dearly and hold tightly to principles and practices of quote-unquote good used car management that were a thousand percent correct in a different environment than ours. But yet we cling to them tightly. And there are many of those today that we still employ without question that no longer serve our interests. There are many, but let me just give you examples of a couple. I don't like losses on used cars any more than anybody like else likes losses. But traditional, quote unquote, good practice of used car management would say that losses on used cars are bad and they should be avoided as long as possible. And I'm sure that used to be right when there were lots of wood ducks hanging around. But we don't have those wood ducks anymore 
And consequently, today, I say that some used car losses ought not to be avoided. They ought to be sought out fast. The earlier, the better. But our old traditional, quote unquote, good practices of used car management would never allow us to see that as a good decision. Another example. I don't like small gross profits on fresh cars any more than anybody else does. But I'm telling you that some small gross profits on fresh cars are freaking victories. We ought to be paying spiffs and high-fiving each other for some small gross profits on fresh cars. But our traditional quote-unquote good practices of used cars would never recognize a small gross profit on a fresh car as being a victory. So you begin to understand what I'm saying, and I could go on and on if we had time on other practices, quote unquote, good practices of used car management that used to be correct. But in our environment, us being the inheritors, the first inheritors of a radically transformed environment do not serve our interests. But nevertheless, we cling tightly to them and unquestionably, and therein lies our opportunity. So why is it that when I ask you the question, who made the smarter decision, the smarter financial decision, A or B, you knew the answer was A, although you could barely get the words out of your mouth, but you won't act like A, why is that? Well, maybe to a certain extent I might have tricked you a little bit. You see, the way I asked you the question, I said, who made the smarter financial decision? And you know what you guys did without recognizing it? You took off your car dealer hats for a moment, and you put on your financial hat. And with your financial hat on, you knew what the right answer was. But put on your car dealer hat, and you can't get the words out of your mouth, let alone do it. And therein lies the problem and the opportunity. You see, it is simply a fallacy and folly, quite frankly, for us any longer to believe that there's enough margin in these used cars today that allow us to do the volume we're capable of doing, and when it's all said, done, and over, we have enough profit left over to make it a worthwhile endeavor. It's simply a fallacy. We, as an industry, are going to have to learn how to make money in the used car business, not just selling cars, but also being prudent managers of capital. The problem is two. Number one, nobody who taught us the business ever knew or thought they needed to be managers of capital. Consequently, they never taught us that we needed to be, nor would they even have known how to do it if they didn't think they needed to. And number two, and this is the more difficult one, for us to act like prudent managers of capital will cause us to violate, in the worst way, some of the most well-established, long-standing, unquestioned principles of quote-unquote used car management. For me to ask you decision to for me to ask you to make decisions on the used car lot that that are prudent, wise financial decisions will cause you cognitive dissonance. It will cause you to come under criticism by owners or fellow managers who don't understand the realities of the environment. It will be like asking you to part your hair on a different side or wear your watch on a different wrist. It will seem very, very wrong. But there is our opportunity. So you see, when I tell you that I no longer believe in managing inventory by age, we were never really doing anything other than what I was talking about right now. The age was simply the best available technology of the era. To me, today, the calendar looks like a crude, blunt instrument. Compared to the ability that you have today, using transparency and technology, to identify these vehicles as early as day one, and for the reasons we already agreed upon, act on them on day one. So if we're not going to manage inventory with age, the calendar, any longer, because it is the old technology, what I would do instead is I would begin to manage my inventory by investment quality. 
Because after all, that's all we're ever doing with the calendar. We're just using an old crude blunt instrument of technology of measurement. I would start managing my inventory by investment quality. So how would I assess the investment grade of a particular vehicle investment? I would do it by triangulating three data points. The first would be that I would put a one, two, or three on every used vehicle and stuff. A one would be a car that you look at and say, wow, that is really a special, unique car. One of a kind. You know those cars when you see them. A three would be a car that you also can recognize. You look at it and you say, nothing exciting about this one. Plain, ordinary car, not going to get anybody worked up. That's a three. And everything in between is a two. So I put a one, two, or three on every used vehicle in stock. That's my first data point. My second data point is its cost to market. And my third data point is its market day supply. Triangulate those three data, those three data points, and then create a sheet and maintain a sheet in your used vehicle department every single day that lists the top 10 worst vehicle investments that you have on your lot. And notice age is nowhere in that mix. Once you develop that list of the top 10 worst investment vehicles that you have on your lot, that's step one. Step number two, and this is the hard one, is I would ask you to act on that car now, today, as if it reached the maximum threshold of your previous gauge limit tolerance. Act on it today. Do to it today what you would otherwise do 75 or 59 days later from now. Act on it today. And, and if you cannot act on it today, force yourself to write down the reason why. And I guarantee you the only reason why would be a wood dog. Hope and pray for a wood dog. And that is no longer a legitimate strategy. Service. And if you're willing to do this, I'll guarantee you two results. Number one, you will never again worry about aged cars. Because these are your aged cars. You just happen to have the gift of the ability to recognize them early. And if you deal with them early, you will not ever again worry about managing aged inventory. And then the second guarantee that I'll give you is that the profits of your used vehicle department will soar. Because what's pulling down our used vehicle profits today are the vehicles that we have in stock that are poor investment quality. And if we can identify those vehicles and address them quickly, we will have a portfolio of inventory that possesses a higher investment grade, more gross profit, and net profit potential. And our ability to do that today is a gift, a gift of the internet, a gift of technology, and therefore, you can hopefully now begin to understand why I think managing inventory by age was simply a crude technology to do what we are already now talking about doing. Anyhow, managing the investment grade quality of our inventory. But once again, the challenge for us is to act in accordance with it will quote unquote violate traditional principles of good used car management. But I want to tell you guys something. Management is about doing things right. Leadership is about doing the right things. Thank you.